Hallelujah. We are so grateful for you folks. You've been behind us uh, every step of the way. Uh, we were in about 15 different hotels. Some were two stars, some were one star, some were five or six star, but, uh, but uh, it was really hectic. We went through about 18 security uh, things at airports, in and out. It was exhausting. Sometimes we were, uh, like in Myanmar, we were uh, inside immigration for about three hours before we got out uh, to clear our visa and stuff. It was an exhausting time, but a very productive time in training leaders. In fact, uh, in fact, we wanted to come back earnestly on, on Monday. That was our original plan. But then another door opened up for East Asia. And uh, my wife and I felt, you know, we don't know how many more times East Asia will be open for us to come in and help train their leaders. So, so we said, okay, let's postpone our coming back. We just got back this, this Thursday. But it was a 13-hour flight up from Singapore to where that place is. And uh, we were exhausted. In fact, <laughs> I have to tell you how human we are. Uh, I was so tired and burnt out even as of that last last Monday. Uh, I kept texting our, our director in, in East Asia and I said, are, are you sure that conference is on? I was hoping he would say no. Uh, but but he said yes at every point. So uh, we felt we need to go. We need to go because God has something for us to do there. And uh, you have to understand the urgency of the hour. So thank you so much for praying for us. I want you to turn to um, John chapter 4, verse 4. I'm preaching from John. Uh, John says so much. My topic today is live in light of Jesus' return. Would you tell somebody that right now? Live in light of Jesus return you see that's one of the most life-changing statements you will uh, you will ever hear you see Jesus return defines the church we're not just a, a a mutual admiration society that meets every Sunday we live in light of the coming of the Lord the purpose of Jesus coming back gives us our purpose uh, it defines me you see when I go through tough times Jesus is coming soon when I go through failure Jesus is coming soon when I face conflict or rejection Jesus is coming soon when I face success and, and effectiveness Jesus is is coming soon. So no matter what, everything is overshadowed by the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Let's say that together. Jesus is coming soon. That defines everything that we do. And when we understand that, that will begin to transform our lives. I have four key points that I want to share with you today that are so crucial for every one of our lives. John 4 verse 4. This is the story of the Jesus going to the woman in Samaria. Area. John 4 verse 4 says this. Now he had to go through Samaria. And then John 9 verse 4. John 9 verse 4. Jesus says this. He says, okay, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no man can work. Okay, so why does Jesus have to go to Samaria? Okay, point number one, know your calling. Know your calling. Say it to somebody right now, know your calling. Okay, your, your calling may not be to be a preacher or an evangelist or a teacher, but you have a calling. And, and whether it's crystal clear or not, you have a calling. Every Christian has been called by God. Somebody say amen. All right. Every Christian, and I've often said, you can retire from a job. You cannot retire from calling. Okay. So why did Jesus have to go through Samaria? In, in the Greek, it's, uh, there was a moral necessity. Jesus had to go. Jesus didn't have to go to, through Samaria. In fact, it was so mountainous up there that the average Jew would not even go through Samaria. They hated the Samaritans. Number one, geography meant that was even a, a harder walk than ever before. 
the average Jew from the northern part of Galilee would come on down to the Jordan River Valley where it was cool and refreshing and there was water all the way along. And as they went down on pilgrimage down to uh, the Jordan River Valley, then they'd come towards Jerusalem and they'd climb up the hill. And as they mounted up the hill and sang the Psalms of Ascent, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. And they see the temple there and they rejoice so much. It was a strange statement that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He had to go for two reasons. One, for the woman that was there in Samaria, the sinful, adulterous, a Samaritan woman whom even the Samaritans hated. They, he had to come at noontime. She had to come to the well at noontime. It was too hot during the day. She would not be welcome during the morning when most people came to get their water or during the evening when most people came to get their water she had to come at noontime and Jesus had to go at that particular time so one it was to reach this this sinful rejected Samaritan woman who had five husbands and the one she was now living with was not her husband even the Samaritans hated her but Jesus didn't Jesus wanted to reach her for the glory of God somebody say amen Hallelujah. The second reason, he was laying the foundation. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, You will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He was laying foundation for the evangelism of the world at this point. You know, this last uh, week, we were actually in uh, uh, that area of, of East Asia. I can't tell you where, but it was a 13-hour flight. On Monday, I'll tell you, I wanted so much to catch the flight straight over to the U.S. From, from, from uh, Singapore to San Francisco would be about 15, 16 hours on a direct flight, but we had to take about 13 hours to get up to where it, it was. Uh, we, we had done six, this would be the sixth pastor's conference in five weeks. It was going nonstop. We were just on the ground in Singapore a few days. We had to do most of any shopping right in the airport itself. And we were, we were exhausted. But somehow something said to me, David, buy up the time. Buy up the opportunity. We don't know what is happening because in East Asia right now, churches are being outlawed in, in many major cities. Uh, 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 they're not allowing children to go to church. Uh, all kinds of things are happening. And, and crosses are being torn down. Sometimes churches are being torn down. And uh, while, while East Asia is really big... Uh, <coughs> We have to take advantage of every opportunity that we can. Now your calling is to sow seed, to make an impact, to take steps of faith, to see every opportunity. So number one, know your calling. You may not have it well defined like I may have or a pastor may have, but you have a calling from God and that's to impact your family and your neighbors and your and I want you to be not just private personal Christians, I want you to be world Christians. Somebody say amen. Now notice I didn't say worldly Christians. I said world Christians. Where we're thinking in terms of the entire world. Jesus placed us on this earth to impact our world for the glory of God. Somebody say amen. Praise God. Okay, number two. Number two. John chapter 4 verse 6. John chapter 4 verse 6. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Jesus was tired. Jesus needed rest. So point number two, get the needed rest. I've discovered in my ministry, and I've discovered in the Bible, that rest is one of the key weapons of spiritual warfare. If you don't get enough rest, a grasshopper looks like a giant. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
You need to get the ad- adequate rest. Uh, 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 Jesus, if you'll study the Gospel of Mark, every time Jesus had intense ministry, preaching and teaching, afterwards he would go to the desert, he would go to a desert place, he would go to the wilderness to realign himself to the Father's will. You need to understand that. Because when we are rested, then we don't face all the panic attacks and all the worries and, and all the concerns that are there. We need the adequate rest. You know, there's a story of uh, the Duke of Wellington. At the Battle of Waterloo, he had to face Napoleon. Napoleon wanted to conquer the world. Napoleon had the tough battle-hardened army. They knew how to defeat every enemy, even if the enemy had more troops than they did. They were not afraid of anything. Wellington, on the other hand, was the British general, and he had to coordinate Dutch, French, British, and another country. These soldiers couldn't even talk to each other because they didn't even understand each other's language. Many of them were were not even uh, uh, well trained as soldiers. But Wellington was a master strategist. I've just been studying about him a little bit. And he, he, he fought with his troops. He didn't stand back. He was there at the front lines with his troops. And, and he would, he would, uh, he had the greatest defensive strategies so that even his soldiers that couldn't fight very well, he, he knew how to protect them and to raise them up to fight the battle at the, at the right moment. But there's something else I learned about Wellington. Wellington, even though he was in the heat of the battle, he could stop and take 15-minute naps. People dying to the left, people dying to the right, guns going over, people struggling. But he could hide under a tree, take a 15-minute nap, and then wake up again and direct the battle. He defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. Now, what I want to say to you folks is, you know, by the way, I know ICLV people are not lazy. Please don't go home and quote me and say, I need to rest a little longer. Okay, please don't use me as the excuse because the rest is, is, is for a purpose. You see, rest, I, when, I, when I train leaders, when I work with pastors everywhere, I say rest before you serve and then rest after you serve. This is true in sports, it's true in anything. You know, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when one of the sports I really love is tennis. But you may not have noticed this, but when they're, when they're waiting for the serve, they if they're right-handed, they really hold the weight of the racket in the left hand, and then when when the serve comes over, then they use the right hand because then they have even more energy when they're fighting for two or three hours in a tennis match. Okay, so so in any sport, in basketball, anything, there's that point of rest before you serve, and and then when you're rested, you have the energy, you have the perspective. You're not looking at the problem; you're looking at the priorities that God is laying on your life. You're, you're looking with objectivity. You see, a lot of us get so overwhelmed with emotion. Oh, there's so much to do, and I can't do it, and the enemy is attacking. And you let your emotions overwhelm you. But when you're rested, and you rest in the Lord, God gives you added strength. Somebody say amen. You see, then you can see the bigger battles. Then you can see the bigger battles. You know, I learned that the hard way. You know, uh, years and years ago, I was, uh, my wife and I were ministering in a Bible college in Canada, and I was academic dean and dean of students. I taught a full load. I was on the board of a Chinese church in Vancouver, and at the same time, I was preaching 180 times a year outside of the school. I was preaching more than most evangelists preach in a given year. One day, it was a Sunday night service in Chilliwack, British Columbia. And I said, God, I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. Give me strength for one more sermon. And God shook me up when he said, David, you've sinned. I said, what? God, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to be faithful to you. Why do you say you've sinned? You've sinned. You have done 
far too much. You need to pause and pray and seek God and let God realign your ministry. I was so shook by that one. I, I, I canceled six months of outside engagements. I still had to do the Bible college work. Six months. And during that time, I prayed and I prayed. And that was the time I got connected with Christian Life Assembly in Langley. I learned how to uh, do uh, lead uh, a larger church that was preparing me for Singapore and what I would need to do in Singapore. And God directed me, used that time to realign me. Then, then, when I came to the Philippines as a missionary, I, uh, I was at uh, Asia Pacific Theological Seminary. You know, I, within a year, they promoted me to academic dean because they wanted more Asian faces, even if the Asian face was a banana. You know, uh, uh, you know, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. It, it doesn't matter. I look Asian, all right? I've been taking pills for it, but it doesn't help. Uh, and, uh, and then within another year, I was promoted to be president. So I had to be president, an academic dean, and at the same time, I was working on my book on spiritual gifts, which would become a major book. And I remember hearing myself say, Oh, David, I'm too busy to pray. And then I knew it right away. I knew I was just too busy if I'm too busy to pray because my strength comes from the Lord. You see, we need to learn to rest so that we can rely on the strength that God gives to each and every one of us. And then, and then uh, about 10 years ago, I, uh, 10 years ago, I asked uh, the board at Grace Assembly, could, could I just take a three-month sabbatical? And they said, oh, we're delighted to let you have the three-month sabbatical. And you know what I did? Because, because in Singapore, you know, rest is foreign. Do you understand? We never hear a sermon on rest. In fact, I heard one preacher say, you know, we work so hard as preachers. Do you know what I like to do when I'm overworked for several months? I set aside a day and I work harder. And I say, oh, God have mercy. And, and, and so I took three months and instead of resting, I came over to America and preached my heart out all over the place. That included some time right here at ICLV. And I preached at schools and I preached at churches. I was just, you know, you know how men like to get a, a car out on the highway and just clean out the engine? That, that's what I thought I was doing. But I got more tired. As a result of that, I came back to Singapore and I had overworked my throat. And so one day, you know, I was preaching four sermons on the weekend, Saturday one and three on Sunday. On the second sermon on Sunday, I started feeling pain in my vocal cords. And I said to my associate, you have to preach the next sermon. And he said, oh, no, Pastor Lim, you can do it. You can do it. You know, he was always my cheerleader. Uh, you can do it. I said, no, I'm in pain. I went to the ENT specialist the next day. He said, you're vocal cords are are hemorrhaging you have a nodule on your vocal cord <laughs> if you understand anything about the vocal cords they're like violin strings they're very sensitive and they vibrate several thousand times per second and so if you have even a little nodule it begins to really hurt your your system and you've got to watch it so so the, so the ENT specialist said I want you to rest for a month and not preach I began to panic you see, if a preacher can't preach, well, you fill in the blanks. All right. And then I had heard about a worship leader, a very famous worship leader, who had a nodule just a little bit lower than where I had it. And even to this day, all he can do is speak about one hour a day in a public meeting. Beyond that, he has to type out his answers and, and all of that. And so I was really fearful. After waiting for about a month, my voice was like this still. And I called him and I said, my voice is not returned. He says, of course, because you're stressed out. And I said, what do you expect if I can't preach? He says, I want you to go three months without preaching. Oh, man. I really lost it at that point. I thought, oh God, what's going to happen to my church? What's going to happen to me? What's, my, what's the future? So I had to sit there in church for three months and not preach. 
And my strength began coming in at that time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Many of us don't know how tired we are. And now the strength began coming in. And guess what? The shock of it all. In those three months where I couldn't preach, the church grew. God says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the people were right behind me and really supporting me and, and, and all of that. I have learned that when you learn to rest, you can hear from God and you can see the greater vision God has for your life. But if you don't rest, if you try to violate what God has created in your life, then you're trying to do it in your own strength. But when you realize your weakness, you realize God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. We need that time to rest and to recuperate. Okay, number three. Think out of the box. Can you say that together with me? Think out of the box. When you look at John chapter 3 and John chapter 4, what a diversity. In John chapter 3, you have Nicodemus, the religious leader, the religious Jew, the, the scholar who had come to Jesus and discussed theology with him at nighttime. And he, he was puzzled, but he was hungry uh, and wanted to know about things theologically and then to apply it to his life. Then you go to the very next chapter. Instead of a, a righteous religious Jew, you go to a, a sinful Samaritan woman and, and Jesus had to go to her. The religious Jew, the educated Nicodemus came to him by night. He went to her by daytime to minister to her. Jesus was flexible. You need to learn to think out of the box. You see, when we're reaching people, some people are easier to reach. Some people are tougher to reach. Do you understand what I'm saying? In fact, my, my brother, who was the academic dean of the Assemblies of God Graduate School in uh, Springfield, Missouri, has written a major volume, a, a study course, 500 pages, about seven major worldviews and how to reach people in each of those different worldviews. You're reaching different people. You can't reach everybody the same way. Think out of the box. Think out of the box. Think how you can gain favor. Think how you can sow seed. Think how you can release that person to the Lord. Think how your life can impact other lives for the glory of God. That's so important. On the other hand, sometimes we talk ourselves into a rut. You know, in leadership, they talk, John Maxwell talks a lot about lids, lids on us that we can't seem to burst through because we talk negatively to ourselves. You know, we talk a lot about IQ, intelligence quotient. We talk about EQ, that's emotional quotient, your ability to relate to people. Now, psychologists are talking about AQ, adversity quotient, where, where you've been, uh, people have shamed you, people have talked negative to you, or you're talking negative to yourself, and you say, I can't do it, I, I, I'm not able, and, and you're so negative that you're not free to be all that that God wants you to be, you know, and, and, and these things hinder you. You need to learn to think out of the box. Let me tell you, just so you can, you can identify and so you don't feel so bad about yourself, I want to share with you some of my weaknesses. Is that okay? I want to share, because I share this with leaders everywhere anyway. Okay, one, one, darkness comes over me when I think I failed. When, when I have failed, when I think I have failed, or when others think that I have failed. Anybody identify with that? Okay, when I failed, I think I failed, or others, I think that others think that I failed. Okay, but what do I do? I just plod through it. I just keep going on. God knew all about my failures years ago before I was ever born. He knew how much I would fail and he said, I'm still choosing you and I will still use you. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Second, you, you, you may not realize this. I am really an introvert. 
I'm an introvert. Of course, you see me as an extrovert. My brother sees me as an A-type personality. I'm telling him I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Okay, but he says, you are. You are, you know. Okay, I may look like A-type. I may look like extrovert. But, you know, I, I, I love you. I love you all. I want, I don't, please, please don't misunderstand. I love you all. But the more I'm with people, the more tired I get. Now, my wife is the opposite of me. The more she is with people, the more she gains energy. In fact, when she's in a shopping mall, no, never mind. Okay. I'm saying, hurry, get out of here, you know. No, no. Uh, we're, We're all built differently. And she calls me a professional extrovert. In other words, I'm an extrovert when I need to be an extrovert. Okay, well, so I take the first step. And pastoring really has helped me to reach out to people. When I was just a a, a professor in a a seminary, I don't have to be so outgoing. But when I'm a pastor, I have to be. Okay, so so I have to take the first step. The third thing, uh, I I tend to compare. I, I compare with people that I think are more talented and more capable than I am. Okay, but that keeps me humble, and I see a positive side to that. You see, uh, uh, Jim Collins, in his book From Good to Great, he talks about five levels of leadership. First level, uh, a person who has a, a lot of inherent talent. The second level, he knows how to contribute to a team. Third level, he knows how to manage a team. But you jump up to the fifth level, this is the executive level leadership that's going to affect future generations. That, that not only affects this generation, but can impact future generations. And, and what he says about that is, as he has done his major research, and studies that there are two qualities to level five leaders that he finds common in level five leaders across the board in the business world and the church world he says the two qualities number one deep humility and number two fierce commitment to a cause well I already had fierce commitment to a cause but God was using all of that to make me realize all my mistakes, all my comparisons, that I am nothing. But look what God can do with a nothing. Look what God can do with a nobody. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. 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 When you understand that, you know, I said to you before, Moses' life is divided into three segments, 40, 40, and 40. First 40 years, he knew he was somebody. He was in Egypt in the palaces. Next 40 years in Sinai, he knew he was nobody. And the last 40 years, he saw what God can do with a nobody. And God can use you and God can use me as we learn to wait upon the Lord. You see, God is developing leaders. And I want you to think about impacting not just this generation, but the following generation and the next generation God has taught us God has called us as the church of Jesus Christ to shake the gates of hell and to and to, uh, to release souls into the kingdom of God until Jesus comes again amen praise God hallelujah 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 okay so number one know your calling because we all have a calling and we need to you, uh, begin to bring God's kingdom into the kingdoms of this world second get the need rest you're not lazy but get the needed rest or else you're going to burn out I've seen so many leaders burn out and I don't want to burn out folks this last Monday I turned 73 and I want you to know age has no factor Uh, if you remain passionate for Jesus Christ the next 10 years, 20 years, you know, in, in Vietnam, they, they said, uh, uh, Dr. Lim, we want you to be coming every year for the next 20 years. I said, let's take it one year at a time. <laughs> you know, I guess because I'm old enough to kind of be a father to most of the leaders over there. And so, so, uh, so, so they said that. Well, we take it one year at a time. But my friend, I hope that your, your, your passion keeps on growing for Jesus Christ from this day on. I hope you don't get up and say, uh, like so many people, I used to be on fire for God. No sense. No, you're not... 
used to be on fire, you should be on fire for God now and every day of your life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So you get the needed rest, then you think out of the box. Think of what God can do with a nobody. All right, think out of the box. Be flexible. You don't have to do it the same way with everybody. Let God lead you and give you wisdom by the Holy Spirit of God. All right, think out of the box. And then fourthly, see the bigger picture. See the bigger picture. Impact the world. John 4, verse 34 and 35, please. The disciples had gone into town to buy some food because it was lunchtime. Uh, I don't know if they came back with fast food or whatever it was, but they came back with some food. And Jesus says something really strange in verse 34. He says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Wow. Wow, he was, uh, th that, that's what gets him going. That's, that's what, what charges him up to finish the work of the Father. And then he says in verse 35, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? There must have been some lazy people there. Four months, then the harvest, you know. He says, I tell you, open your eyes and look on the fields. They're ripe for harvest. In the King James Version, it says, the fields are white already to harvest. Any of you who have any farming background, you know you don't reap grain when it is white. That's almost overripe. You reap grain when it's gold and yellow. Okay, Jesus says it's almost, almost too late. It's almost overripe. When I was, when I was uh, beginning in Bible college, there were about three billion people on the face of the earth. Today, there are 7.7 .7 billion people on the face of the earth. You know, uh, we have a huge challenge ahead of us. It's interesting when you study the Gospel of John that timing is very important. I just saw that yesterday when I was working through this sermon again and again. Nicodemus came at night. That was his timing. He, Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at noontime. That was her timing. In John chapter 7, the disciples say, Will you go on to Jerusalem for the festival? And Jesus says, My time is not yet. Uh, and he would say that several times. In, in John chapter 2, at the wedding in Cana, he says uh, to his mother, My time is not yet. And then in John chapter 9, the night comes when no man can work. Jesus is very sensitive to the urgency of the timing. And then in John chapter 12, when the Greeks come to see Jesus, finally, finally, Jesus says, the time is coming and now is that the Son of Man will be glorified. Jesus was very sensitive to the urgency of the hour, sensitive to the timing that is there. You know, in the last 30 years... In the last 30 years, there have been more souls saved in the kingdom of God than if you counted every soul saved from Calvary to 1990. There have been more souls come into the kingdom of God in the last 30 years. It's harvest time, my friends. Hallelujah. 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 At the same time, there are more martyrs who have died for Jesus. There is more intense persecution. Almost every country my wife and I go to, there is persecution. We have to be very, very cautious. When we go into certain areas in East Asia, we shut off our computer, we shut off our iPhones, we, uh, we make sure that we carry them with us so nobody can access them. Uh, that's so important. But, but you see, in spite of it all, God's kingdom marches on. You know, uh, in Nepal, where we go, in Nepal, we, we did a, a school of missions there, and I was sharing them with them how to develop strong, healthy churches to uh, uh, church planters there. There, there's a law from the government, no evangelism. Christianity Today had an article that recently said, the fastest growing church in the world right now is in Nepal. The church of Nepal is growing and growing and growing. Hallelujah. 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 See the bigger picture. In John, John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22, John further, Jesus further says, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. 
Now, if you understand in the Gospel of John, the father-son relationship is really incredible. Probably about 150 times, father-son, Jesus is, and the father. Jesus is the only begotten son of the father. So if, if you understand father, how much he loves you, how unconditionally he loves you, how he wraps his arms around you and cares for you, and, and how he sent his son to die for you, as the father has sent sent me same calling so send I you and then in the very next verse he says receive the Holy Spirit I want to empower you you don't do it in your own strength I want to empower you you have an incredible calling Jesus says I don't do anything except that what I see the father doing oh that we would have such an intimate connection with the father that we we would understand what he wants to do with our lives friends I don't know how many more years I have I don't know if it's one year or if it's 20 years but I want to use every year for the glory of God I want to keep growing in passion and serve the Lord Jesus Christ and I and I and God needs you God need would you look at someone and say God needs you hallelujah all right now you see Jesus is coming soon I want you to look at John uh, look at Revelation chapter 22 please as I come to a close Revelation 22 can the worship team come up please Revelation verse uh, chapter 22 the last chapter of the Bible Revelation 22 verse 12 and 13 Jesus says look I'm coming soon my reward is with me and I'll give to each person according to what they have done I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last the beginning and the end my friend Jesus is coming soon then all your problems are small ones Jesus is coming soon your failures are small ones Jesus is coming soon your successes are to help build your faith Jesus is coming soon oh then then their conflicts and and seeming six failures that's okay Jesus is coming soon and that that should be preeminent in our minds then if Jesus is coming soon take courage victory is right around the corner Jesus is coming soon Jesus is coming soon we need to sow abundantly because there are 7.7 billion people on the face of the earth and maybe one in four claim the name of Jesus Christ we have a job to do Jesus is coming soon and we need to maintain our passion to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart mind soul and strength my friends here at ICLV and if you're new here at ICLV you may not really understand this is a unique church we really are a unique church I'm proud Pastor Denise I'm proud to be be part part of this team that you and your husband lead I'm really proud this is an incredible church folks and we're not just a church to be a nice church we're not just a church to impress anybody else we're a church that is here to hear the call of God and to fulfill his plan and purpose on this earth. Pastor Denise, would you come, please, at this time? Hallelujah. Father, bless this church. Anoint this church. Anoint everyone in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.